All right, that's the point. Is it not? Worshipping Allah. Okay, knowing Allah. Worshipping Allah means to know Allah. Then when you know Allah, worshipping Allah, who's the best worshipper of Allah Azza wa Jal? Alayhi salatu wa salam. Without a doubt, that's what Allah wanted. So Alham al Nabi alayhi salatu wa salam. He inclined the Prophet of Allah alayhi salam and he revealed to the Prophet of Allah alayhi salatu wa salam and he sent Jibreel alayhi salam to teach him exactly how a, how a worshipper should be. So when you get to the stage of worship, which is what? What's the stage of worship? Muhammad alayhi salatu wa salam. So they all don't fall into those confused thoughts that are out there. That are oh, Abdullah. Yeah, Habib, what's Abdullah? Muhammad. There's no, there's no doubt about it. There's no thought really that's necessary. It's clear, clear cut. Abduhu wa Rasuluhu. So all this, you know, that oh, it's only Sunnah and all this, you know, oh, Allah and that. Yesterday the brother was saying that he heard one of the Mashaykh on the internet. Yeah, look, the Quran's all good, but you know the Hadith is. How is the Hadith questionable? How? Okay, if you think that hadith is questionable, then you can talk about the, the actual transmission of a hadith and istilah al hadith, which is the science of, of authenticity of a hadith. Fair enough. But you can't tell me that oh, you know, it's all questionable. You can't say that. Because the Prophet of Allah, he's the guide. Once, once anything about the Prophet of Allah is questionable, our ubudiyah lillah is questionable. So this whole. That's why we always try and not only look at the practicalities of things and not only look at the, the theories of things, but what the result is. That way we can get the full picture of what it means to follow the sunnah of the Prophet of Allah. That's what Allah wants. Do it. Allah loves you. What else do you want? What else, what else is there greater than love of Allah, Ridwan Allah? They go together. Allah's not going to love someone he's not happy with. No one's, no one's going to love someone they're not happy with. They might love him as a person, but there's not going to be that... that altruistic, that giving, that sacrificing, all the things that we associate love with. It's going to be, yeah, okay, I'm not going to harm you, and you live, and I live, and you be, and I be, but there's no interaction in the sense of uh, any sort of interaction, really, other than that, okay, I love you for a person, you're a human being, you're an animal, you're a tree, you're whatever, and let you be. But it's not the love that people share in terms of um, inclination to each other. People who are inclined to it, they spend time together, they sacrifice for each other, they give money, they give time, they get all these different things um, so that that relationship can in me and be nourished and increase. And that's what we're looking at in this world so that when we get to the next world, the reflection of the life we had is manifested in firstly, Rid Allah, and secondly, as we said, Jannah. If it's not, then not going to happen. It's not going to miraculously by the time we die till the we get resurrected, something crazy is going to happen. Unless you've done something like jariyah, unless you've raised pious children, unless you've you know, taught people specific things, or that might be a bit different. But if you've done that in your life, your status is going to be a particular status. You're going to be loved by Allah or loves those things. So th- th- there's no you know, magic potion, no pill you can take, no app you can download, no button you can press to, to become an abd of Allah. A true Abd of Allah. The only way to do it is to be like Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. That's the only way. So that's why we're going through all these things. So the, re- the reality of that enters our hearts and our minds and then hopefully our bodies, inshallah, azza wa jal, and our whole essence and our being. And that's the embodiment, as we said previously, the embodiment of the sunnah of the Prophet of Allah alayhi salatu So don't forget that we talked a lot about the ills that are, that are present in our society regarding sexuality. Um... And we, we talked about those things and we discussed how we can protect ourselves from those things. What, what did we say? Any, any thoughts? Anyone remember anything? No? Um, the most ruling of is as long as you gaze, protect your, protect your, uh, your eyes where they look at and what they look at. All right, so it's the senses that we have, they lead us to action. Right? So with dhikr, why dhikr is so important? We do dhikr because our senses are connected to Allah, our tongues, our minds, our hearts. It, it tends to, and generally when you're going to do dhikr, you're not going to be in a place of ill repute, so even our, our person. So then generally when a person is remembering Allah Azza wa Jal, and their senses are connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then their actions are going to reflect that. And vice versa, if a person is thinking of lewdity and, lewd, and lewdness and fahsha and munkar and uh, you know, all, all these different when I hold the you know, promiscuity, all these different things 
a person is thinking about it. A person is, you know, involving their eyes and their ears in it, reading about it, listening to it. Of course, they're going to end up that way. The inclination of the human being is going to, it's just the natural. If I start talking to you about Hawaii and how great Hawaii is, you say, oh, maybe I'll visit there one day. Because then I said Alaska. Oh, that sounds interesting. And then I, oh, no, I'm picking on America. Then I said Peru, for example, so, or, or Kenya. It's just the natural inclination of a human being. The things you hear about constantly, you become inclined to. That's what advertising is about. Coca-Cola is the most popular product in the world. But they never let you forget it. You'd think that being as popular as it is, they'd stop advertising and say, Carlos, we've got it under control. They don't. They keep advertising. Keep, and even worse, gambling and alcohol commercials. They're the best commercials on TV. They're the most interesting, the most funny. Because why? Keep, even though it's the vice of human nature and a lot of people are doing it, and whoever gambles, pretty much they, stop, they don't stop. And whoever drinks, pretty much they don't stop. So why always the advertising? Why? To keep it in our mind that you need this. This is important. This is who you are. This is what you're about. Keep the embodiment. Fresh. Of course, the constant in different ways as well. That's the beauty of ibad. I go back to the, the same thing. Ibad is different. There's dhikr, there's Quran, there's you know t- salawat, tahajjud, all the different things that, that are you know fasting, um, uh, khidmah, helping people, writing, reading, learning, all the different aspects of ibadah that keep one connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that constantly remind one of Allah. And no different whichever way it is. It's the technique's the same. Human being has the same re- receptacles to understand information and, and uh, understand uh, stimulus that comes to the human being. So it's through those senses. If we protect the senses, we protect the soul. And if we protect the senses, and actually more than just protect them, but positively um, involve oneself in the actions that drive to piety in, and, and, um, uh, and hishma. Hishma meaning that like al um, is being chased, but it's more than that. It's not even getting into a circumstance where a person would be questioned about, you know, the the, the sexual inclinations and fulfilling their desires in, a, in an illicit way, anyway. So it's it's that easy. Once you start going down that road, once anyone starts going down that road, once one starts going down that road, there's there's no end to it. And look, that's what happens to people when ultimately they end up doing the most vile things in the, in the aim of you know pleasing themselves sexually and then they end up you know like some of the, the rock so-called rock stars they have to strangle themselves while they're having intercourse in order to to feel any sort of high from it and they die they die that way what's that man so the way you're supposed to feel pleasure the only way you can feel pleasure is by getting yourself so close to death so that, that, that makes no sense it's a fahshat it's a fahshat so we have to understand what's going on in the society in which we live. And if we can understand what's going on in the society in which we live and compare that to the, 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 the ultimate criterion, which is the Prophet of Allah and, and, and the Qur'an, of course. The Qur'an is the, the, the criterion. And the, the action is the Prophet of Allah and the Qur'an. The Qur'an is the criterion in terms of the theory and the methodology. And the Prophet of Allah is the, is the criterion in terms of the practice. So then... We can live the life that we need to live. But if we just know the Sunnah, we know the Qur'an, and we know what the ulama said, and there's no understanding of how to apply it in the circumstance in which we live, it's going to fall short. And we're going to say, there's something wrong with this deen. Something's missing. It's not fitting in. Or, the other way around, the whole world's lost it. You can't have that approach. The whole world's lost it, and only people who want to do That's, that's the, uh, the Daesh mentality. It's only us, and everyone else is lost. Whether you're Muslim, whether you're Shia, whether you're whatever you are, that's it. Well, you think that, that uh, us, me, I'm a solicitor, I work in the Kafi system, so they won't spare me. They won't spare me. Or well, you're involved, see you later, alligator. That, that's, that menta- that's what breeds that mentality, lack of understanding of how to apply the Sharia. Don't know how to apply it. Uh, it's a, we hate this. How many times I've sat with people that I've respected and they said, oh, we hate this country. Said, what are you doing here? Muslims and scholars and other people, you know, we don't like this. We'll go back to your own country then, if you don't like it here. This is this is this is Dar al-Amil. This is the field of of um, of plowing and, har- and uh, planting and harvesting. It's, it's a fertile ground for for Islam, 
And if that's not the approach we have, then really, what are we doing here? Particularly if you're a person of scholarly background, or well, you don't like this country, and why? <laughs> What's this country done to you? I don't, I don't get it. it. Doesn't make any sense. Your, your, your children go to school for free. If you get sick, you get medical attention for free. If you want to go to university, you go all the way to the doctor for nothing. You pay back if you have the money. If you don't, don't worry about it. Uh, the, what, what is it that you don't like about this country? I don't understand. What's so much better about our countries or the, you know, the Middle East countries now as they are? Yeah, historically they're fantastic. Spiritually, yeah, they're, they're okay. Maybe, maybe you might say not, depending on. Okay? But what, what's the issue? Because we don't know how to apply the deen. We don't understand the circumstance. So how can you apply the deen when we don't understand the circumstance? Anytime anyone comes to ask a fatwa or, or a masala from a, from a mufti or a sheikh, he doesn't just say to them, oh, we want to know about riba. Riba is this, and riba is that, and this is the ruling. This is what they, don't, they, don't start, they don't start telling them all the rulings. And they say, what's your situation? What's your circumstance? On this and on that, and they kick you, I've got 15 children, whatever, 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 whatever. Okay, you can do A, you can do B, you can do C. I, I recommend to you A, B is permissible, and C is permissible, but it's the, it's the closest to not being permissible, but it's, you choose. That, that's how it works. And so if we don't understand the waqiyah, the status quo of sexuality and what it's about, we're going to fall into the trap. And don't think marriage is going to solve it. Don't think that, oh yeah, I'm going to, you know, my shahwa and my desires and my passions and, you know, and, and my sexual inclinations and my inclinations. Uh, um, oh, when I get married, they'll be fine. Oh, look how many people are cheating on other people. Look what's going out there in the world. And if you really noticed, you'll see people that are close to you, the way they act with each other, it's not proper. There's something amiss there. There's something amiss. Why? Because it's, Allah well, what's going on? Marriage so it doesn't. The desire is not solved by that. If the desire isn't madbult, if it's not um, encompassed and, and, and limited, there's no limit to the desire of a human being. There's no limit. The whole dunya doesn't fulfill the desire of one human being. Is it ten dunyas? It's ten and then fifty as well. It doesn't, it doesn't fulfill the whole dunya. If one person lived on the dunya and got to do whatever they did, they still wouldn't be satisfied. That's how Allah made us. So a person who thinks they're going to you know, work up their sexual their, 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 their fervor, and then when they get married, they get, it's not going to happen. Because... What's in one's mind is very rarely reflected in reality. And what's in one's heart is never reflected in reality. There's, 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 those two, there's no correlation. There's no correlation between the two. They're, they're, they're completely different aspects of what a, a person envisages and then what a person experiences. And if, you, if an individual lives in their desires and their dreams, they're going to be disappointed and frustrated. And when it comes to sexuality, one of the worst things that an individual can be frustrated in is their sexuality. Because when Allah Azza wa Jal, it leads to destruction. It leads to total and utter destruction. And we know the story, you know, Imam Haddad told us, you know, the guy who had a donkey and he wasn't married and they said, what did you do? And he said, oh, you know, I fulfilled my desire with the donkey. And not knowing that it's a, it's a, it's a big sin, bestiality, and both the hukum is both of them if in an Islamic proper Islamic system both of them are subject to capital punishment so these are the things that we have to protect ourselves from and this and we have to have our own techniques that we develop ourselves from from the times we make our own mistakes so if you're the type of person that you know if you watch sport for example whether it's male or female and, and you, there's an inclination there or an arousing arousement Arousation, I don't know which arousal. arousal. Arousal, thanks. If there's an arousal, then you have to not watch that sport. You've got to stay away from watching it, even though it's something that you might like. Right? And then don't don't think that it's not going to be in a homosexual way either. Don't think that you might not see someone something that oh, tickles your fancy, so to speak, in that way. You have to stay away from that thing. Whether it's, you know, it's, it's it, when it comes to the 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 sexual perpetration of one's own desires, it's, it's, the nafs is so tricky. The nafs is so tricky. Even it can be that in your job, in your job you meet people from the opposite gender, it's jaiz. 
but it's the it's the the shahwa. It's the desire to meet someone from the opposite gender and talk to them and find out what they're about and and delve into their lives and hear their stories and if the, if there's a, a passion behind that, then that's an issue. Sharan to, to deal with someone's not a problem, but it's as we said, it's the inclination and the innate state of one's own sexual psyche that determines whether that that relationship is going to either get closer to Allah or further from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if you're in a field that deals with other people, it's fine. Shut up, it's okay. But what's your what's your itijah? What's your what's your focus when it comes to the when you deal with people of the opposite gender? Uh, are you getting off on it, or is it that someone that you know you respect, or someone that you know, the father of your of your friend, whoever it might be, talks to you in a particular way and it makes you feel good? Maybe we might call it flirting in different circumstances. If that's the case, then you got to watch it. Uh, is it that when you're in the shopping center or whatever, you know, 15 different guys come up to you every you're there, are you married, can we ring your father, whatever the case might be. If that happens to you and you're putting yourself constantly in that situation for that to happen, then you've got to ask yourself a question. You've got to ask yourself a question. Why am I doing that? If you're just going about your business and it happens, that's one thing. But if you're there seeking that to happen, you're coveting in that sense, then it's problematic. Right? If you're the type of bloke that you like to go to the beach or whatever it is, and then when you're at the beach, you get plenty of leers from, which is I find amazing these days, from people of the, or from females, then you've got to watch yourself. You've got to pick a beach that there isn't that many females, or a time where not that many females are there. You, you've got to, you have to be your own police when it comes to that. And then if when all the the individual is an individual that, that self-satisfies, sexually speaking, then that individual has to realize that I can't spend time on my own. If I do, I need to have a different way to deal with my own personal life. If I'm an individual that gets aroused from, I don't know, teapots, then I've got to be careful when I'm around teapots and stay away from them. As an example, you know what I'm, what I'm alluding to. But then you've got to, that individual's got to control themselves when it comes to that particular desire. As people have fetishes, that's, like, that's what we've got to realize. Some people, they can't enjoy themselves unless the feet are involved. Other people need ice cream. Other, everyone's different. Everyone has their own. That's the whole thing with that desire. And it changes because it's all about the new and the different. And that's why like the, the, the hadith about uh, 70 hul'in, they, they say virgins. It's not virgins. Hul'in. Hul'in is not even a human being. It's just the creation of Allah. Azza wa Jalla. That, that's their job. Why are they wide-eyed maidens? Is it described? Why are they hul'in? Why are they... It's the first time that uh, it's a virginistic in that sense. Virginal, again, in that sense. Because it's new and it's exciting. It's the newness and the exciting, the excitement. That's what sexual arousal is based on. Yeah, it's, yeah but seven, 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 seven. But don't forget who's talking to the Prophet. He's talking to Bedouin Arabs. What do they know? And then the sophistication of the universe and the galaxy, the, uh, the, the levels that one might reach by the Tukum Kalimatullah al Uliya or Hiya al Ula. Who are you talking to? The context has to be always mentioned. As we said, the context. Who are you talking to? Bedouin Arabs, what do they see? Animals, you know, doing their thing. That's, that's as exciting as it gets to these guys. You know, and I'm not saying they're silly, they're just, that's the way they are. If you want to compare what the Prophet might have said to, you know, someone in 2015, you can't. You can't say, or a non Muslim. The hadith is to Muslims. Prophet is addressing Muslims who are better than simple people. They can't be compared. There's a totally different context. That's why Allah mentioned in the Quran, يَعْرِفُونَ الْكَلَامِ عَمَّ مَوَادِعِهَا وَبَعْلِ الْكَلَامِ عَمْ بَعْلِ مَوَادِعِهَا There's two different verses. That they, they inhir off, they veer off, they, they, they change the context of the word in which it's pronounced. That's all they're doing. Yeah, the Prophet said it. They no worries back then. Or the woman is like a like a bent rib. Who's oh, but she's bent rib. Okay, what if I say men are from Mars, women are from Venus? Oh, that's perfectly acceptable. So it's a context. It's the context. And and if we don't understand the context, we're not going to understand the deen. We're not going to get it. And that's one of the things I believe and one of the big issues that's going around. So our sexuality has to have context. There's got to be a context. And don't think that if you're going to do haram, like Without going into too much detail, how many times I sit down with a couple and the guy's still 
you know, watching pornography. Well, he'd been married for 10, 15 years. Because when he was young, he was watching pornography and he couldn't stop doing it. He couldn't stop. That's it. It's a habit. It's an addiction. It's the excitement. It's the difference. It's the, who knows what they're coming up with now. Maybe they're in space. I don't know what's going on. All right? It's, it's that total difference of, and that total, the excitement factor. So don't think that you're going to involve yourself or anyone's going to involve themselves in a, in a lured activity and they're going to break it later on. And don't think that a person's going to get satisfaction. Don't think that a person... Halal makes a person stronger and Allah puts the satisfaction. Haram makes a person weaker physically, mentally, the rest of it. And when Allah... And how many times I've sat with brothers and sisters, the brother when Allah all his life has been doing haram, he gets married, he loses interest. He loses interest in his wife. When How do you think that's going to manifest in a relationship? Particularly when she's never been with anybody. She's waiting for this guy. And all of a sudden, what comes from him? He's not, he lost, lost interest. He's not, not, oh, when I was young, I was, you know, a fahal. Now, why? Because all the haram. All the haram. When I was all the energy is gone from his body. Allah took it away. That's it. So don't, don't for a moment kid anyone should kid themselves that, oh, I'm going to change when I get married. Um, it's not going to happen because the gariza it's called gariza in Arabic is the, the, that sexual desire gariza magruza in other words it's it's implanted inside the human being and it's a very difficult thing to change ask the people who are addicted to sex there's a you know there's a whole thing that um, there's a whole thing there's a whole psychology of people that have that addiction and see if they can get off it. See what the, the struggles they've got to go through. See what situations, dangerous situations they put themselves in. Un- understand what they, 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 they have to go through. Just to stop that, when I hold the that gariza, magruza. It becomes, gharaza is to put something inside something. So like the plant. Ingrained. ingrained. Yeah, ingrained, yeah. Like the plant, gharaza, fil arb. You, you, you plant it, you it inject rooted. it. It rooted into it. It, it. it rooted is probably the best word. So that thing becomes rooted inside somebody. And what roots do? They, they're all messed up. They're all over the place. You can't pull out. A, it's very difficult to pull out a plant without, getting, without breaking the roots off because they're, they're, they're infused inside the soil. That's pretty good. So infused is probably the word. Gharaza, infused inside the human being. And it's, and it's part of our nature. And we as Muslims, we don't deny it. Allah doesn't deny it for us. Like we spoke about last week, celibacy. We don't have that stuff. There's no celibacy. There's no monkeys in Islam. So, but it's manifested in a permissible way. That's the difference. So, anyway, we'll talk about the rest of it another time. So we'll continue. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Alhamdulillah, Fi Ni'amahu, Ika, Fi Mazidu, Wa Salatu, Wa Salam, Ala Khayyidu, Naam, Wa Ala Ali, Wa Sahbihi, Wa Salam, Inna Namayna, Ta'alimu, 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 والسنة رسول الله ابتغاء مرضات الله وقربه وتوابه سبحانه وتعالى. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the most merciful and beneficent and we ask him to shower us with his mercy and grant us beneficence in this life and the next and we ask him to send copious unlimited blessings and salutations upon our beloved Prophet Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam Sayyidina Imam رضي الله عنه وعنكم نفعنا به وبكم says وإذا قصدت بيت الخلاء لبول أو غائط فالبسنا عليك واستر رأسك بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على رسول الله وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم وقال الله الرحمن الرحيم يا رب العالمين when you go to the lavatory for either of the excretory functions wear your sandals and, and put something on your head all right so again this is again the good old you know people oh oh this one now why do you want to do this they with they making the atom bomb and you know, they're on the moon and whatever. Okay. But we're not saying don't make the atom bomb. Make the atom bomb. Go to the moon. Have a sta- space station. But do the sunnah while you're on the space station. Walk into the khala the right way. Because the whole point of it is not to build it. The whole point of it is what? To use fun. Right. Read Allah. Isn't that right? Allah to love you. Doesn't matter what you're doing. Doesn't matter what you're doing. The whole point is that that you achieve the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out of it. By following, by being a abd, the only way to be a abd is follow the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. This is a very, very, very simple equation. It's not complex in any way, shape or form. So, 
if we understand that and we apply it in our lives, then the, the baraka will be there. The illumination, the understanding, the enlightenment of the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ will enter our lives. And then we'll get to have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with Allah where we can understand what Allah wants from us. And we can understand the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the life which we lead. So he said, if you intend to go to the house of Khala, Baytul Khala, Khala in Arabic is a is a place that's low. And in the old days they didn't have toilets. Uh, that's one thing maybe that passes our minds when we think of it. They didn't have a room that was piled all the way to the ceiling with lights and air conditioning and now they've got heaters in it and, and in the States that the actual because it's so cold and cold that the ground's heated and some places they've got carpets in their bathrooms because it's so cold. And you know, the water and all these things that they didn't have that. The houses were just a little place to sleep and a little little fireplace in the corner. And that was it. The, the Prophet's house, Ali Sattusalam, where Sayyidatna Aisha Allah Mardana she used to live. So Hassan al Basri Allah Mardan, he went there, he was only thirteen or fourteen. He said when he stood up, he couldn't stand up all the way. So you know how small it was. And the Prophet she used to say Allah Mardan that when he used to lie down his feet used to stick out into the masjid because it was connected to the masjid. So they're very small, not like our mashallah. But the Prophet said that that big house is Mubarak fiha. So it's not that we don't have that. If if Allah gives it to you, yeah. You've got to sell your life, sell your deen, sell your, your kids, sell your family to get it. Different thing. Okay? So if you, if you, قصدت, what does he say in English? This is when you go to the laboratory. Okay, so when you, when you intend, when you have a resolve, قصدت, when you resolve to go to the, the house of lowliness, and it's got, it's a double meaning. In reality, they used to go to a low place. Why do you think they went to a low place back in the day? Pouring down with everything else. That's one reason, but what else? So you can't be seen. Because if you're up high, guess what? Everyone's going to see. But if you're in a low place, only when people come closer, you know, they'll be able to see you in a low place. So so it's low in, two, in that sense, and it's low in that an older belief. It's disgusting. Even if it is shiny and carpeted, it's still disgusting. Especially if you're following someone in there. Okay? If you have to go for number one or number two, فَالْبُسْنَعْ فَالْبِسْنَعْ لَيْكَ so make sure there's a lot of Muslims don't do that in their homes. Put some sandals or some shoes or not shoes, thongs in your bathroom. Do not go into the bathroom without wearing thongs. The reason is, and he says, later on he says, uh, oh, it doesn't, the reason is that what's in there? What's in the, the, the toilet? Germs? Filth. Filth? Yin. Shotin filth. Okay, the shotin, they love filth. So they go in there and they cover themselves with, with crap, you know, poo, you know what it's called, right? They cover themselves, but they love it, they enjoy it, no. Look, there's the, the shatin, the shiatin al-marada, the hadith says. Marada is the mischievous, troublemaking shiatin. So the thing is, the shaitan, or the, the jinns, to hurt you, they don't have to be mischievous. It can be accidental. Like one of the one of the classic things is when you throw hot water. The old days we don't throw hot water; we just turn the tap on. But in the old days, they throw their hot water, and so the, they say, "Say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim," because if there's a jinn there, and you throw your, your hot water on the jinn, the jinn gets scared. Their brains aren't as strong as ours. Their bodies are stronger, and they'll bilbisek. You get possessed. Or smack you. All right, or copper hit. That's right. Or they blow on you, or anything happens, and they're so strong. You're going to get damaged by it. So it's not that they're evil. Some of them are. Some of them are pious. Some of them are more pious than us. Some of them are around. They're Sahabis. They've been around since the time of the Prophet of Allah. Said to Some of them are even before that time. They live a lot longer than us. Okay? So it's not that they're mischievous in that way. It's just that's their territory. You know, and it, you know, you jump in the water and there's a shark. It's going to bite you. That's just how it works. So, you know, whatever. Go in, into a corner and there's a redback spider. They're going to bite you or a funnel web or... Go where there's a snake and startle it. It's going to bite you. That's the nature of even you. Like, you know, when you watch the YouTube videos and they scare people and someone was, even a woman, like a little girl, punch someone in the face. It's just a natural reaction. Okay, so you don't want to put yourself in a scenario where because of ghafla, because of your own negligence or recklessness, you end up, you know, getting affected by one of these jinns. So where, in the, where do they enter from? The feet. Most of the time, they enter through the big toe. So, 
you don't want to go into that place and step on them, for example, and they go into you. So you wear your shoes, or your, not shoes, sandals or thongs or whatever it is, in your bathroom. Every bath you should not enter. You should not enter. You know, I know the Prophet said it's a sunnah and all that, but I would say that in this day and age, especially in Australia where there's heaps of jinns, because they live in the trees, they live in the open areas, they live on the oceans, we've got heaps of open area, where the, one of the least, we're the most, one of the most sparsely populated countries and continents in the whole world, we got plenty of bush and they love that stuff. Go to the Blue Mountains and you go there, you look, you go, how does anyone even, how do they even get here? It's just bush everywhere and cliffs, so that's where they live. They live. And plus, our suburbs are quite leafy, even Auburn, and there's areas of parks and a lot of trees and things. They, they live in the trees and whatever else, away from human beings. So, I would say it's wajib in my book, not in, not shara'an, in my book, wajib not to go into any toilet unless you've got thongs on or your own shoes, or whatever the case might be. It's a very dangerous practice, extremely dangerous practice, especially if you're going to a public toilet, watch out. Because where do you think they hang all day? They don't need to go through the door when it's locked. And most of the doors that are locked on the, on the public toilets are, uh, they're not even proper doors. They're just like mesh and that stuff. They hang out in there and Allah alam what goes on in a public toilet. Don't even want to think about it. And the disgustingness that's there, watch out. One of our friends, subhanAllah, any time he goes to a public toilet, cops it. They blow on him, they do something to him, and he loses his mind. Just for a, few, a little while. So you got to watch out. And then the more the more raqiq your own soul is, the more you know, like gentle your own soul is, the more easier it is to get hammered by these things. So my advice is, don't ever avoid as much as possible going into a toilet without having shoes on. No, no, no. Opens fine as long as you're not on the ground. Well, yeah. It's better not to. It's better to wear, you know, better to wear your, your, your thongs in there. And then also, which is not mentioned here, nakhama. Don't spit into a toilet. Don't urinate into an open drain. Things like that. Like when you're in the shower, be careful about things like that because it's stank in there. I don't know if you ever stuck your nose in that thing where the shower is. It's stank, and that's where the because the same thing, they go, they, they can affect you. They can come. The worst place to get in gin is through your mouth. If it goes through your mouth, bad news. So you want to, you know, be careful about these things. If you do, so if you're in the toilet, you can't say that. So you just got to be careful. These are little things that make your life easier. I mean, these things you don't. We've got enough problems with the with the real the shaltin of the ins, let alone having the shaltin of the gin on our backs. Alhamdulillah, it's Ramadan, so it's you know those things that they're less likely to be occur. But you never know. You never know. They're just, like we said, they're like kids. The jinns, their brains are like kids. They're a bit simple. And that's Allah's hikmah of Allah. They're much, much stronger than us. But you can't, if they gave them the brains, we, they, we wouldn't be able to live on this earth probably. They'd just overrule us. But So Allah, that's the wisdom of Allah. Same thing, all the animals. Like look at the, the tigers and that. The guy's got a whip and the tiger will just rip the guy apart and it doesn't. It jumps through the hoops and does whatever. The brain is, is the, it's the key, rather than the bears, they even do it with bears, you know, crazy things like that. Even the guys with snakes and crocodiles, and the brain always overcomes everything. It's the, the wisdom, and we're the, the most intelligent of all the Allah's creations on this world anyway. All right? What's Nakhama translated as? Um, what's Nakhama? You know, the phlegm. Okay. So, so okay. phlegm, whether it's from the nose, sorry, ladies, back here, but I don't know why us blokes. They cop it badly, and the sisters don't seem to cop it as much. Or maybe they just hide it better. Um, so just be careful. And the head also, you can be affected from, from the head, you know. So covering, covering your head is also important. You might want to, like I, what I do is I've got a cap, and I just put it in the bathroom, and so that way it's easy. So whenever I go in there, just put it straight on. And there's shoes always there. That's, I think, the best way to do it. And the shoes you wear in the bathroom, you shouldn't wear them in the rest of the house because they've got the jasa on them. You know, so you should have a special pair of thongs. Wearing shoes in the house is stupid anyway. All right? It's, it's, it's against the sunnah, firstly. And secondly, there's no necessity for it. Why would you wear It's uncomfortable. You want your feet to relax and take it easy. So really, like the Turks are the best. The Turks, you'll never go to a Turk's house. You'll ever see anyone wear Even their guests, they know. If you're Arab and you want people to take their shoes off, like, like it's like, you know. Kafir or something. <laughs> what are you doing? Yeah, Why? I mean, it's, you just went outside in your shoes. Why would you want to walk in your home, your nice clean home, in your shoes? It may, especially if you pray. Like, why would you want to put your head on the floor where you don't know, like, inadvertently someone may have stepped in something with Allah? 
it makes no sense, you know. So that's that's the other thing that you want to be um, aware of. وَقَدِّمْ رِجْلَ الْيُسْرَى فِي الدُّخُولِ وَالْيُمْنَى فِي الْخُرُوجِ Put your left foot forward as you enter and your right foot as you exit. Okay, so when you're entering anywhere that's bad, not just a toilet, like if you're going to a garbage tip or, you know, you live in units and you've got to put your garbage in a certain space or uh, whatever, you're going somewhere where it's not nice, where it's a bit disgusting, then you enter with your left foot and then you exit with your right foot, which is the opposite to the masjid or your home or wherever, where you enter with the right and exit with the left. <laughs> going to anywhere these days. How did summer, when summer you'll find out. وَقُلْ عِنْدَ إِرَادَةِ الدُّخُولِ بِسْمِ اللَّهِ أَلَّهُمَّ إِنَّ إِنِّي أَعُوذُ بِكَ مِنَ الْخُبْتِ وَالْخَبَائِثِ And say before entering, بِسْمِ اللَّهِ أَلَّهُمَّ إِنِّي أَعُوذُ بِكَ مِنَ الْخُبْتِ وَالْخَبَائِثِ He has to say the Khabaithi here. No, it's just Khabaith. It is, مِنَ الْخَبَائِثِ وَالْخَبَائِثِ I always learned that Khubthi. Yeah. Anyway, it's, it's in, a point for you to... In the name of God, O oh God. Khubat or same thing really. In the name of God, O oh God, I seek your protection from male and female demons. And it's not its not just that Chabat is anything filthy. So it's, it's got double connotation. Filth, and that's internal and external. Because, you know, when you go, that's going back to the Gariza. Going back to the, the you know, the, the infused aspect of us. When a person's in that place, of course they're going to have those kind of thoughts. Especially when one sees some of the Salihin, they didn't look at their private parts. They, they, even they had showers with their izan and things because they didn't want to get into the situation. They knew their own selves, you know. Some of the salihin, like Ibn Majah, he, he had four wives. Ibn Majah had four, and they say that he used to go to each one of his wives every day and do what he had to do. And he used to fast one day on, one day off, and every day he had his own supply of roosters, and every day he used to eat a whole chicken. But this is Ibn Majah, he's a muhaddith, he's like a big wali, but that's how he was. Abu Bakr al-Mandu, he hardly used to eat. He's, he's so skinny, his eyes used to fall off his hips. So they're all different. They're all different. And everyone has to work out themselves. So some of the Salihin, they would shower with the Izzara. They would never look at their private parts. Only when the time to shave, they would cover it up and just do what they got to do. Clean themselves up in the right way. Look how beautiful our deen is. Everyone's stank. You see the guy, I find the most stank thing, the dudes that are all ripped, you know, with their six packs, and they do this and they got oh, this God. disgusting... You shaved everywhere else, man. Why wouldn't you shave under your stank? You, you girls don't know how bad we stink. When you got hair there, it's disgusting. It's the most stank thing you ever want to stank in your whole stankness. It's just ridiculous. And they shave everything, wax it, maybe out of shul, oil it, this and that, and they go like this, and it's just boom, this disgraceful, disgusting, big blot. And it really looks ugly. It looks ugly. Like your whole body is all smooth and, you know, uh, you know looking fly. And all of a sudden, we got this disgusting thing. I don't know. Look how beautiful our deen is. Alhamdulillah, I've never seen that before. You've never seen any photos of any of the dudes that not, flex? Not bad enough to, to speak about it. <laughs> Maybe you've never noticed. Now you're going to, every time they say, Sheikh, yeah, you yeah, just yeah, scarred yeah. me for life. <laughs> 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 it's always there, every time. I've never, I'm yet to see any one of those guys, whether it's a basketball player. I don't know, maybe there's something that I noticed. Or something. Because subhanAllah, when we were young, my cousin and I, and we started to get, you know, we're like, this is disgusting. We started shaving it, not knowing that it was the sunnah. And later on, because it was disgusting, like, all of a sudden you got no hair there, and then all of a sudden you got hair, then all of a sudden you start smelling bad. It was disgusting. And so maybe that, I've, got a, I've got my own problem there when it comes to issues. All right, so the khubat and the khabaif is two things, filth and the jinns. وَعِنْدَ الْخُرُوجِ غُفْرَانَكَ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ الْأَذِي أَذْهَبْ عَنَّ الْأَذَى وَعَثَانَ And as you come out, say, غُفْرَانَكَ أَلْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ الَّذِي أَذْهَبْ عَنِّي الْأَذَى وَعَثَانِ عَنِّي الْأَذَى وَعَثَانِ All right, so that's when you exit from the, the khala, seeking the forgiveness of Allah. Why do you think we're seeking the forgiveness of Allah? Okay? All right. That's it. You, you, you really, it's limited in terms of the ibadah. But the salihin, they're always, they're always a, ten steps ahead. One of the ulama, or one of the ulama in Yemen, one of the mashaykh, like who lived years ago, that was from the chain of the mashaykh we studied from, he finished seven khatam of Quran in the khala. Seven, but not reciting out loud, just in his mind. So when he'd go into the, and throughout his life. So when he'd go to the khala, and we'll already take our iPhones in, and the old days used to go to people's Australians in particular. They got a magazine rack there. 
and then you, you know. And look, that makes that makes sense because our lifestyle is against everything. So, you know, like all year round, it's nine to five at work. How does that make sense? How does that make sense when the sun comes up at four thirty or five o'clock in the summer to start work at nine o'clock? It makes no sense. How how does it make sense to work till five o'clock when in winter sun's setting at five to five? It doesn't it doesn't matter what job you are. It doesn't make sense. How does it make sense to wear a suit in the middle of summer and a suit in the middle of winter? It doesn't make sense. Like, it, uh, fair enough, it's tradition and this and that. And then when we do our traditions, that, that's stupid. Why do you do that? That's stupid. Well, isn't it stupid to wear a suit in the middle of summer? It's like suits came from England. England is cold. The, the hottest, if it's 28 degrees in England in the middle of summer, it's a heat wave. <laughs> 28 is probably our average in summer. I don't know what it is, but I'm sure it's around somewhere like it doesn't make any sense. Plus, they don't have the humidity we have. It's stupidity. In Spain, they have Kailula, siesta. In Mexico, all the countries except the Western, Western countries, the only countries that don't have it. So in the middle of summer, they start work early. Makes sense if the sun's coming up at 5. And they work till like 10, 11. And they go home, and they sleep, they come back at 3, they continue the day. Or 4, or what? Considering the sun sets at 8, why is that an issue? Why is that an issue? But anyway, this is things that we can talk about and debate and think about and talk to other people about. So we're, we're out of whack. You know, we're, we're out of whack with our society. We're out of whack with, not our society, we're out of whack with, with Allah's world, the universe that Allah has just created. So it makes sense that when we go to the bathroom, because of the foods we eat and the way we live, that we have pro- problems going. Because that's, that's a sign of stress and it's a sign of you know, not being happy. The way because we can't so of course we need magazines and books and phones and whatever else it might be when we're in the bathroom to forget about you know the stresses of our life so we can relax enough to go to the bathroom unfortunately that's the reality misfortunately so the, instead of wasting our time on facebook and whatever else it may be that we spend our time you know remembering something good about something else if you can of course you can't and we'll talk about that in a sec so that one of the one of those uh, imams that's what he used to do. When he used to go to the Khala, he used to recite. Then remember what he was up to, keep reciting, and he did seven complete. Of course, he was Hafiz of Quran, so he used to do it. Gufranaka, alhamdulillah, ladi ada banna al ada, anni al ada wa afani. So we're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we're giving thanks to Allah. And I was reading a hadith just the other day that Islam has two portions, or Iman has two portions sabr, perseverance, and shukr. And if we can, if we in this society can can embody both of those principles, we'll be all right, inshallah. Because we're never happy, we're never satisfied. Firstly, we want things to be our way. Oh, just yesterday or the day before, we were at the masjid, and uh, they, the masjid's on a corner, and there's a street outside the front, and the council said they can pray in the masjid as long as they park in a car park, which is like six level car park, which is almost across the road. It's probably another. 30 meter or 40 meter walk, maybe 50 meter walk from just being right in front of the masjid. And so the, they don't want us to park on the road just because they're idiots, all right? Okay, they're racist. They're, I don't know, if, I'm just giving you the example, all right? But the, the mosque administration has said, please don't park on the road, park in the council car park. That's the condition. So the brothers don't. So subhanAllah, a couple of days ago, once someone lost control of their car and plowed into the back of one of the brothers' parked cars. And then when we came out, one of the brothers was saying, look, I always tell you guys not to park there. And then one of the guys got upset. I'm like, bro, what are you getting upset? It's only for Muslims. I said, yeah, bro. Whoever says, la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, should park his car inside the car park and they're racist. Why is it, why is it an issue? Why are, we, why are we surprised that people are discriminating against us? Why? That when the whole Quran, the whole Quran is implicit and explicit about since the day of Adam alayhi salam, people discriminating against Muslims because they said, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad. Like, what is the deal with us? Why don't we get it? Why don't we understand that, that if you say, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, you're going to suffer. Get ready for it. You, that should be the first thing that comes into your mind. Why, why is it such a surprise for us? I don't get why we're so shocked. Oh, this, okay, fair enough. Go and go to the court and... You know, there's the law there and speak to your member of parliament and march in the street. Okay, do it. But why are you surprised? Uh, well, I don't, doesn't make it, don't we read the Quran? Don't we understand what happened to the life of the Prophet His whole life was discrimination against him. 
once he became Muslim, that was. Before that, he was the golden child. Then he became Muslim, and he started calling people to Allah, and his life became miserable in that sense. Of course, not really, because he's with Allah, and Allah loves him, and he's got the spiritual enlightenment and connection with Allah, so he's not affected by it in that way. The thing is, on the outside of it, his parents, his, his parents, his family turned against him, his tribe turned against him, his people turned against him, his town turned against him. They kicked him out. They were going to murder him, assassinate him. So why are we shocked? Why are we, you know, on our high horses and taken aback when people just... Like, that's, that's the way it is, mate. That's how Allah told you it's going to be. So Allah says in the Quran, there wasn't the prophet that we sent that when he delivered our message that his people turned against him. Why is it so shocking? Well, I, don't, I don't understand why we're such, you know, we're enraged by it. Why are you enraged? Sabar! Persevere! Persevere. When you persevere, what? Ajr sabr Jannah, I will, I will, um, as you say, subhanahu wa ta'ala, shayin tuhabbuna, something that you like, nasrun min Allah, wa fatun qareeb, one of the two. Either Allah is going to change the circumstance and you're going to, and you're going to be victorious, or it's not going to change the things, you're going to die and you're going to be victorious. There's no loss for the believer. There's no loss. So persevere. And secondly, say, Alhamdulillah. Don't say, oh, if only Tony, I think he had a different prime minister. He was a bit more liberal and a bit more left wing, and he wasn't so hard to get. Australia sucks, man. I hate Australia. Why? Say, shukr. Find the good things, man. They're giving us millions of dollars for our public schools, our high schools. Well, is that an issue? Muslim countries, you may ever find that. Well, I don't understand it. I don't. What, what's the problem? Legally, or right, socially, that you're going to be discriminated against. But legally, you have the same right as anybody else. Same right on the paper, that is. And if you go to court, the cultural issues in front of a white judge might be different. Yeah, okay, all right, that's part of it. But your legal counsel has to be able to bring that issue up and argue that issue in front of the, the judge. What, what's the? You can run for parliament. You can make the the Islamic party if you want. There's no, no, no nothing to stop you from doing it. You can talk about Abbott all day long on your Facebook account. You can say he's a wanker, you can say he's a dickhead, you can say it's legal. You can say that, it's legal. You're allowed to legally say that. No one can stop you from saying that. What don't you like? What, you don't like the fact that if you get sick and you can't work, they give you money? You don't like that fact? You don't like the fact that they supposedly tax from the rich and give to the poor? You don't like that fact? You don't like the fact that you can, you know, study, like we said, to doctorate and not have to pay one. What is it you don't like about this country? You don't like the fact that Australians are humble people, generally speaking, and they're not, you know, super egotistical, patriotic, let's kill everyone and we're the only ones that need to survive. They're not like that. What, what is it you don't like? What is it? Say alhamdulillah for the things that are good. And the things that are no good, make dua to Allah and try and change them. That's the, so, sabr and shukr. If we, if we have those two things, then we won't have a problem. Or we won't have a solution to a problem that exists. A solution will always be there. A solution will always be there. So, when when it comes to the, the alhamd, alhamdulillah, ala kulli hal, in all situations and circumstances, even for the fact that Allah allowed us to 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 excrete, excrete that poison that's in our bodies, even to that level, we're thanking Allah for it because it's only through Allah's order that it happens. So that connection to him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, is there in all circumstances, in all situations, from the most mundane and even in this sense, in a sense, uh, grotesque or gross, not grotesque, gross. Even in that circumstance, we're remembering the fuddle of Allah Azza wa upon us. And then that person who's constantly remembering Allah won't go astray. Allah won't let them go astray. Because they're connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa'afani. Wa and he alleviated that situation, that difficulty. There's a story, a famous story they tell about a Moroccan king. He um, couldn't go to the toilet, got sick. So this is before the days that he was, he was a Berber, he wasn't a Muslim king. And so he said, Who's, who can help, who can help? Sent out word in the kingdom, sent out word throughout the world, went for a long time, he was going crazy. And a man came to him, a Muslim guy, he uses potions and, uh, not potions, but uh, herbal medicine. And he said, I'm doing it for you, but what are you gonna give me? He said, what do you want? He said, I want half your kingdom. He said, done. <laughs> half his kingdom just to go to the toilet. Would you do it? Of course you'll do it. 
Of course you'll do it. Then he gave him the potion, he went to the toilet then, and guess what? He couldn't stop going to the toilet. Because he's been, whatever, back. So then he called the guys, he said, call him back, call him back. What? I want to stop going. What are you going to give me? <laughs> half your kingdom. The other half of the kingdom. He said, will you do it? Yeah, of course you'll do it. So even that aspect that we don't, we don't think about it because we're above that. You know, we sit on a throne when we go to the toilet. Isn't that what they call it? Isn't that what it's called? There's no squatting anymore. Unless you, which I recommend you get one of those things that, um, that you put there because they're talking about all the bowel cancers and colon cancers and all that are coming from sitting on the toilet and you don't, the person who sits there doesn't get a chance to excrete all the excrement because of the way the bowels are turned and all those things. So it is actually the best way and you can get attachments that like, they're like a school type thing that go next to your toilet and you just put your feet up and you can squat. I, I recommend everyone get that because the body of the Prophet Sally is the same. He said, he said, bait with that, the, the colon is the house of illness. And that's what all the, the, the medical studies are saying today. And that place, that part of the human body doesn't get a chance to be emptied properly when one's sitting rather than squatting. That's the natural way Allah made it. So even the toilet is a throne. Mahak, going to the throne. Look what the people, that's what they say. That's the common vernacular. That it's a throne. So we don't have to worry about anything anymore. Don't worry about Allah. Oh, why should I thank Allah? I'm sitting on a throne. Not only that, it goes into water. I spray it. This day I don't have to even smell it. Doesn't have to worry about it. Doesn't have to worry about it. There's a great meme, is what they call meme or whatever. It's got this African kid and he's looking at someone weirdly and he goes, what, you guys got so much water that you actually, you know, you go, you go to the toilet in it? And that's what it is. And there's 17 liters every time you flush. 17 clear Drinking water. That water is the same water that you drink from the tap in your, in your kitchen. There's no difference between the water. It's exactly the same if you drink it. Alright? He says, وَلَا تَذْكُرُ اللَّهَ عَلَى تِلْكَ الْحَالَ إِلَّا بِقَلْبِكَ Do not invoke God there except in your heart. Alright, so as we said, it's haram for a person to say the lafz al-jalala. Who knows what the lafz al-jalala is? The pronunciation of the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's called the lafdul, the glorious pronunciation. The lafdul jalala. The glorious pronunciation. It is haram to say it inside the toilet. Because that's why it's called glorious. It's, nothing glorious goes on in the toilet, does it? I hope not. And look, the best bathrooms are the ones that have the toilet on their own. And then they have the bathroom... Uh, that you know, different. That doesn't apply. All those rules don't apply to that thing. So that where there's a where there's a shower and a basin and a bathtub it, it, um, separate to the toilet, those rules don't apply. It's different. You can go in without your shoes. You can do it because it's not a place of filth. It's a place of cleanliness. It's a hammam. So, but still, uh, holes in what they call drains. You've got to be careful about drains because the jinns love drains. Even the like you know the um, uh, you know the stormwater drains and all that. Don't let your kids play there. Don't sure. let them go near that stuff. They're full of them because it's an empty area. They don't have a problem with water. That one, okay. just be, yeah, try not to spit into it. Spit into the oh, thing, and right. you know, even the, the, some people they get a cup and they rinse. You know, be careful about those things because they stank. And anywhere that's stank and nothing and and putrid, you, the jeans will be there. The jeans will be there. That, that's their thing. Some what the angels? What do they get off on? Noor. And especially the shiltin, the shiltin jinn, they get off on filth when all of them are And it, look, it's a reality. I remember one time when we, were, where we, we lived in Campbelltown, it must have been like an Aboriginal burial ground because the house was always going off in the middle of the night, taps turning on and you know things opening and closing. And one time we came and we'd seen the jinn standing right in the bathroom covered in crap. I was seen it with my own two eyes. My own two eyes. That's, how, that's what they do. That's how they are. And we're at Campbelltown because it's a newly developed the area we're in. It's a newly developed yeah, block. Open, open that, space. Just new. Yeah, of course. And oh, open, trees and yeah. that's what they like. You know, it was a newly developed then. I'm talking 20 years ago. It wasn't as developed as it is. And across the road, what do we have? A huge open park and with trees and bush and scrub, as it's called. So th that's the reality. If we don't understand, like, we don't get scared of ghosts. Why well, guess it's a jinn. Why, why? We, don't, we don't believe in UFOs, aliens. It's a jinn. You know? Ma'roof. Zombies. Jinn. Right? All those things that trolls, fairies, 
Uh, what else do they have, man? Pixies, gnomes. Pixies, gnomes, yeah. Leprechauns. All that stuff. They're all just different types of... Anyway, you can see them. SubhanAllah, someone sent me a link last time. They've got these cameras they put in the wilderness. And then when animals come by, they photo them. And SubhanAllah, man, there's this one. It's got a jinn. Clear photo. It's a, it's a goat jinn. You can see 100%. There's no doubt whatsoever. And he's look, even looks surprised because what happens? The flash goes on. It's 100%. I, I couldn't find it after this. I said, delete it. I watched it. And then someone, I thought I was telling someone. They said, oh, send it to me. I looked at it. It's gone because of my trash deleted. Was it was a girl, like part of human parts. It was a goat. No, no, it was not a human. It was a gin, full gin. Yeah. It was a goat. You know, it had like a, looked a bit like a human, but had a goat head and stuff like that. And <laughs> it was kind of 100%. There's yeah. no doubt. Don't look at that stuff at night, you know, because you get scared. <laughs> but because it plays in your mind because we're not used to it. But we should be used to it. We should be used to it. That's why if you hear a, a bump in the night, it's probably one. We don't get freaked out. Just leave it. Go away and pretend the study didn't happen. Because if it plays in your mind, then they come and play with your mind. They'll come and knock things. They'll come and poke you. They'll come and pull your clothes while you try and sleep. They'll try. And they might be Muslim jinn, especially if your house, you read Quran, you don't have TV in your house. You, you know, you don't, all those things. You, you, and, uh, you know, your house is, mashallah, clean in that sense. You don't feel filthy and all that. Um, they're probably Muslim jinns, but their brain, they want to play. Some wake up for pleasure. Yeah, Some, yeah. Clear voice. Yeah. Um, 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 yeah, they poke you and stuff. That, but they also want to play. They want to have a good time because their brains are like kids. So they'll come and give you a hard time, you know. They just poke you and whatever else. It's, that's the. So we don't get scared. One time we did a lecture at the something strange Christian college of Arab was where all the scholars of, of Christianity were there. I go, do you guys even have jinn? They're like, no. I said, no wonder they're scared. No wonder they're losing their mind. You know what I mean? They don't, even, they don't even understand a whole other part of, you know, a different realm that's existing with them. They, they don't accept it. Of course they're scared. We're not scared. Like those movies, you know, the paranormal activity. What paranormal activity? It's normal activity. Get rid of para. It's normal. It's, well, they're jinns. They live. They exist. They, they go to school. They go and they make hafad of Quran. They do everything that we do. Everything we do, but in a different way. And in Jannah, we'll see them. They won't see us. We'll have that that difference. Maybe we can play around with it. I'm sure we, I'm sure we'll have better things to do in Jannah. But if you want to, I'm sure you could. I don't know, but you know, that's the thing. So those things shouldn't shouldn't freak us out. And we should teach our kids about it. We shouldn't teach them about Santa Claus and the Easter bunny and what is it? Mother Goose and all that. Why do you want to teach your kids about it? Why do you want to lie to your children? Don't, don't think it's not for nothing. It's so that they don't accept truth. When you accept lies, it's hard to accept the truth. When you live a lie, you can't accept the truth. So it's, don't think it's like innocent. It's not innocent. It's not and like the kids dress up as fairies or they come with their magic wands and they want to do magic. Don't teach that. Haram, magic haram, ya habibi. We do dua. Dua is our thing that makes things change. We don't do magic. You know? like you got to be real careful about that. Your kids, your brothers, your sisters, your nephews, your, your nieces... You know, they, they do it. They think it's normal. It's not, not it's haram. It's haram, the way abracadabra. That, that's, a, that's an Assyrian word. It's an actual spell. It's an actual spell. It's a, the, they speak Syriani. You know, that's their language. That's what it's, you know? Like all these things that we don't, we don't think about. But us, inshallah, if we take the path of perseverance and the path of shukr, which is the path of the Prophet of Allah, yes, sir, eh? Then we will be able to withstand that. Any I know you got questions, eh? Ask, please ask, because it's a good time to talk about it actually in Ramadan. Because we won't have any second thoughts. But outside Ramadan, you always like, what's going on? Um, if the if you have a shower and it's sort of semi closed, so the gate step is still open in your bathroom, do, do the rules still apply? Especially it's best to be careful. The good thing about the shower, it's always clean because the water's coming into it. Just specifically in terms of what's the muscle jalada. No, no, no laf al jalala. If it's open, it's got to be completely separate. If it's a to- Some scholars have been saying that, oh, once the toilet's closed, but it's not about the toilet itself. It's about the place of filth. And that's in my view and the view of the, in particular, the traditional scholars. Wherever that, that toilet is, it's a place of disgusting. Like, if the shower's like, yeah, like there's little small doors, like you close them to the shower, but it still opens up into the bathroom. It still opens up and it's open. open. There's, there's no session. place for love. It's not closed. It's got to be a separate place. Like you said, the best of them, are the toilet is in that little... Oh, they used to do that in the 60s. All the bathrooms, all the houses Daddy. were like that. 
Now, I don't know why, but maybe it's cheaper and easier not to do that. But if you ever build your own home, even in the units, the old ones, they used to have it. Toilet was a little closet. They used to call it the water closet. closet. That's what it used to be called. It's this big. That's exactly how it should be. Shouldn't be this plush thing where, you know, before. A little place you go in there, do what you got to do, fans on top, it's all over. It's a done deal. But these days, you know, they got the spa in there. How are you going to have a spa and the toilet's there? Doesn't make sense. So if you ever get a chance to build your own home, make sure you build a toilet separate to the bathroom. That's why one's called a bathroom and one's called a toilet or a water closet. Bathroom is where you bathe, it's different. You should have the chance to relax there if you need to. But not when there's a toilet around. It's disgusting. I remember reading that one of the ways of getting of losing a baraka or losing baraka is to actually have you to do wudu in the in the in the toilet. In the toilet. There are some scholars that say that, but we can't really get around that, so That's don't silly. don't stress about that. You know, the other thing is if you go to the toilet and you can't go, don't sit there. There's in the Tub al Nabawi when came in Qayyim al Jawzi, he mentions that it leads to mental problems later in life and things like that. So you go there, try not to spend too much time in the toilet, and you go. You can't go, get up, walk around, do whatever, and it might come back, it might not. But don't just sit there and say, oh, I'm going to see here till it comes. It could be sitting there for, I don't know, half a day or something. I don't, I don't know. But, you know, be careful. And then if that's your problem, it's not, a good, it's not good to be constipated. Then you've got to watch what you're eating, watch what you're doing, change your food, change your diet. Even when it comes to gin things, when a person's constipated, it's a bad sign from, you know, being affected from ain or, or hasid or something else. Constipation is not a good sign. It's because it blocks it. What happens when you get constipated? Blocks the shield just starts building up. Sorry. Right, you get, yeah, that's it. And then it, it, it affects the rest of your body, it affects the way you think, it, it throws you out of sync. You know what I mean? Out of, it's not good to have a, a constant diarrhea, but it's better to have, in, you know, talking in the spiritual sense, not the health sense. I don't know what the health sense is. You have to ask your respected medical practitioner. But in, it's, a bit, it's better to be a bit loose in the spiritual sense than it is to have be constipated because it leads to big time issues. And then, you know, don't hold, what, if you have to go to the bathroom, don't hold it. Even if you have to pass wind in those things, don't hold it. Even the ulemet say that, some of the ulemet say, um, Habib Kadim says that as well, that even if it's in salat, let your wind go and then go make your wudu again. Because it's unhealthy to hold on to it and all it does is, if there are issues, it exacerbates those issues. And we're not talking just about jinn. Anything that affects this person spiritually, is, is manifest. That's why it's doubted that it's the play, the essence of illness is in the stomach. That's what the Prophet said. Ali said the same. Clear hadith. So these are things to watch out for. Um, you know, in your in your regular life. So if that's the case, stay away from refined carbohydrates. Anything like that. Stay away from all those things. Stay away from anything. That sugars as well sucks the the um, dehydrates you. So keep your hydration up. When you think you're hungry, drink first, and then afterwards eat. That'll keep your keep your system a lot more supple. Start with salad first. That's always the sort of fruit. Even when you're breaking your fast, the dates and then eat something fruity is good, you know, and then the soup later on. That's always a better option. But us, mashallah, Allah Akbar. Whatever you can get into your stomach is that's no good for you, no good for the system, no good for, for your mind, no good for your body, no good for your soul even because it makes you lazy as well. Any other questions about those things? No. Um, if you're in a mashab with and then you're going to do like, Yeah, stand on your shoes if you can, you know what I mean? If you can do something like that and then get the serviettes or the napkins they have and dry your feet while you go. I know, I know like we're, it's a lot more difficult for us. That's why it's more important. Public places, like, I, I don't know, I think I've told you this a story before. When I was the first as solicitor, our firm was next door to one of the old school Aussie firms. You know, not the huge firms, but old school, well established firms. And the guy, you know, I used to always talk to him, you know, he's, 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 you know, he's this bloke, probably never seen him. This is before September 11 and all that, like, ages ago. And he used to freak out, and I, and I used to talk to him, hey, you know, this, that. And, and, there was, and then he's, he's on like $350,000 a year. Back then, that's probably like. You know, 500 now, 450 yeah, or something. Yeah. Okay? And, and I used to go in the Hamem, it was a big issue. Make sure there's no one in there, suss it out, get the bottle, fill up the bottle of water, go there, make sure there's no one to come out. And then you could see him, he used to come in, go 
go and do his business, standing up at the urinal, which is pretty disgusting, and then just leave. Never wash his hand. After that, I have to grab the tissue, open the door with the <laughs> tissue, because it's disgusting. It's disgusting. I look, you know, look at the difference. So people, you don't know what they're doing in the public toilet. You know, they're not careful where they urinate, if they step in it, if they walk here, if they walk there. And all that does is breed, when I hold the you know, filth and khidf and khaba'ith from both mentalities. So you you got to be careful rolling up your, your, for men in particular, rolling up your jeans or your pants or whatever when you go into a public toilet. It's a must. And that, that'll come next week in the hadith, in, the, in the, what the imam says about, you know, your your uh, clothes and making sure they don't get... you got to be careful when you go to the bathroom, wiping the toilet. Wipe the back as well. Always lower the thing and look at the back. It's generally funky and yellow and there's pubic hairs and stuff. It's disgusting, I know, and you know, I don't want to say it, but I, we have to say it. That's true. Make sure that it's clean. You know, make sure that where you're going is clean because if you get it on you, you're a goner. Your prayer is invalid, void. No. Um, <laughs> hey, that's a good idea. Awesome, that's a good idea. You know, and for us gentlemen, like we we don't have that problem with our wives of leaving the toilet seat up because we don't we don't go with the toilet seat up. It's makruh and the shara to urinate while standing. So, you know, for us, we need to be aware of, of those things, you know, and making sure that you can... It'll come next week, we'll talk a bit more about these things. And I know that, like, they seem disgusting and that, but these the, these simple things, especially when we're doing it with the right intention, Allah <laughs> Nabi alayhi salatu wasalam, how's this salat going to be? How's your life going to be? Where wherever you're going, even to that most mundane thing, you're thinking, how can I follow the order of Allah Azza wa Jal? How can I follow the sunnah of the Prophet of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam in that thing? Wherever I go... You're a different person. The concerns of the hamum you have, the 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 hamum is more than concerns. Like the the stresses that you have are related around Allah. You're stressed out about following Allah. That's taqwa. Stressed out about following Allah. That's taqwa. That elevates not, not to a point of waswasa, of course, not to the point of I don't know what it is waswasa in English, like craziness, We're saying, crazy. yeah. you know, but to the point of to the point of that your life is on a particular path all the time, wherever you are, wherever you go. That's 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 success. That's istiqama. Nah. Um, I was going to say, I know someone who had an issue with what to say when it comes to sunnah or prayer in the bathroom. What advice would you give them when they start? And that's it. You do the sunnah and that's it. It's tasar ala sunnah. So if someone, they, they have to wipe their private parts five, six, seven times, that'll come next week anyway. And they always, it's no good. Right, so there's, the ulama talked about it. So if someone has doubt, then they should know their own self. So if, if someone needs to, I don't know, pour half a liter of water on themselves to be assured that they're clean, because that's the way their their private parts work, the urination or whatever it might be works, then they have to do that every time. But what it should be is that you have to find out what your regular thing is, because generally it's the same. It's it's rarely that it's not the same, unless a person's sick, generally speaking, or they've you know, gone, changed their diet, they're in a different area, they're traveling. Unless it's those two circumstances, generally things are pretty much the same. So everyone has to work out their own problem, their own pattern. So some ulama talk about that, to not, it'll come next week. We'll, we'll talk about those things specifically, but when someone's got waswasa, they should work out what that pattern is and stick to it. Okay, so it shouldn't be half an hour. Some people with half an hour, I've seen them. You know, like you go somewhere, trip with them, what's going on? Half an hour, why? Well, you don't want to get into it, but... You have to. What's going on? This, that, that. So some people should walk, you know, after they go to the hammam, so after they go to the toilet, to make sure that any qatarat, any drops of of, uh, of urine or whatever is clean. Some people should. There are different things. Jumping, that's another one. Squatting, different things that a person should do to make sure that they're satisfied that that is come. Then they come clean the area. They make wudu and it's over. It's over. The 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 waswas is easy to get in those things. You know, the istibarat min al bowl to be clear of, of, of urine in particular, is a big thing in our deen because that's one of the major things that causes people to be punished in the grave. I think it was Saad, one of the Saad, one of Mu'az. He, you know, that's what happened to him. And he, he started to getting punishment in the grave. And Allah said, Ya Allah, innahu Saad. He used to love him, the Prophet was saying. And he said, he didn't used to clean himself from urine. One of the big time Sahabas. Alright, so those things are very important, but work on your pattern. If it's, you know, 
like the, the men, the chef talks about it, the imam talks about it next week, how to, how to clean one private part. That's how you do it. And then if that works for you, you stick to it and that's it. You stop at that point. You don't say, oh, maybe this and maybe that. Then if you have, and the doubts should come when you're, it, it, you're having your pattern. So sometimes you feel a little bit funny in your, after you've gone out. So you come back, you check it. You've checked it 10 times and nothing's there. The next time it comes, you don't check. That's it. It's a done deal. You've done what you've done. And the feeling, you, you, especially if you've got waswasa. One of the, the, the people who had waswasa, and he's like, oh, you know, because they people used to write animals, animals used to be around. He goes, you know, I feel that the hairs and all stuff of the animals are on me. I'm not really sure. And so the imam that he was asking, he went and got some goat uh, manure, crushed it up, and he put it in his pocket. The guy freaked. He goes, just carry this around in your pocket for the next month and keep making your do Because there's one cold in the ulama that says that the animals that can be eaten, that are halal to eat, their rauf, their manure, isn't najis. Shafis have two. The main opinion is that it is. But the Hanafis in particular, their opinion is that it's not. Fine. So he used that opinion to get the guy to forget about all the waswasa he had. Remember that in his pocket he had, you know. So th- that's the techniques to, to break the waswasa. It depends on the individual what their waswasa is. More, they have, have specifically, generally speaking, you know, the waswasa to break whatever they, they, they've got going on. <coughs> Yeah, that's it. You can't you make dot for him. You know, and, and with the we'll do it with the makeup, it's if it can reach the skin. I don't know, I've never worn makeup, so I wouldn't know. But if it can reach the skin, then it's okay. If it doesn't reach the skin, like I don't know, there's some of that stuff they put mascara or whatever, that thing here, they put it on their eyelids. Does it get there? You know, I don't know. You, no, khalas and spot. That's a that's a big issue. That's a, like poor people, you know, they're wasting their time, they're wasting everything. And the, one of the ulama was talking about it recently that at the end of time, you know, people won't have salat. The hadith in Arabic, you know, less salat. And the, and the scholars were saying that, oh, well, everyone's praying. They said, but that's not the meaning. People don't know the ahkam of the salat. They don't know the rulings of the salat. They don't know the inner workings of it. So there's no salat. That's, that's a, you can only pray for her. I mean, if you've if advised her once, twice, three times, miskina. Miskina. Who are they trying to impress? Hey, probably themselves most of the time, but Allahu uh, Alam. That's a good question, Mashallah. Any other questions? Yeah, go ahead. No, that in the Shafi'iyah, I've heard other things in the in the Hanafis, but I don't know. I don't. I can't recall. We studied it, but I haven't used it in a long time. Because the ibadat, I just focus on the Shafi'i stuff. There's no need to think about anything else. And then the Shafi'iyah, if you purposefully break a fast for whatever reason, you just make up that day, and then you got to pay the fidya. Yeah. Because what happens is, if you if you break a fast, um, even even permissibly. So if a woman. Um, is, it breaks the fast because she's suckling a child or she's worried about a, a pregnant child or the brother's traveling or he gets sick or whatever. Or even, You have to make up that fast before the next Ramadan. If you don't make it up before the next Ramadan, you have to make it up and pay fidya. Fidya is to feed a poor person at that meal. So that's what you would do. So if you had, you know, you, 10 years ago you didn't fast, you didn't fast. From the time you were baligh, okay, from the time you were mature, sexually mature, you got to, I mean, no one, sometimes you don't remember, but you got to make your best endeavors to think about when that time was. Maybe for a sister, it might be a bit easier because it's kind of a bigger sort of event that occurs in life for the brothers. Sometimes we don't remember it. But then just, if, you, if you're really scared and you don't know, then you go from age nine, because under the chef, yeah, the first age you can become barely as nine. You work it out, and then you pay the $10. Well, it's probably more than that now. You can't get a meal for 10 bucks anymore, can you? Where at? No, no, no. I mean, like, if you were go in the street and get a meal, get lunch. But, but isn't it if you have to come over to... 
It's your meal. So I, I, don't, I, I reckon I've ever eaten a meal less than 20 bucks, personally speaking. Minimum, so, minimum 15. Yeah, yeah, I mean, so I know they're saying 10, but I don't think so. I think that's a bit of a long, long straw to draw. Um, so whatever the... Uh, and look, it's better to give from... At least from the, the medium of what you eat, also to it, from the muscle. So you look at 15 or 20 bucks. Alhamdulillah, we don't have problems with money. We all got money, alhamdulillah. Very few of us don't have much, much money. And then work out how many days that is, and then make them up. Make up those days and pay 15. Should we say 15? I think that's fair, or should we say 20? Whatever it is, you work it out, and then you pay 15 or 20 bucks for every day you didn't fast. And it's a good time to pay now because it's the middle of Ramadan. So work it out, taqbiriyan. Roughly, it's about this many, and then make up those days before next Ramadan. So any any sunnah nafil fast you do, you make the intention firstly the fard make up, and then that sunnah whatever it is, and, and then the shafi'i there's no problem. You can do fifty intentions, which is alhamdulillah to Allah to Rahman. All right. Anything else? No. الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خير الناس وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم يا رحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على محمد بعد ما تبت علينا فتوح العارفي مطبط أحكام على الصراط المستقيم يا أرحم الراحمين صلاة أن تطير علينا من بركاتك ورحمتك وفضلك ومنك وكرمك ورزقك يا الله يا أستاذ تجيب أسنان تجيب أسنان يا الله يا أستاذ أبلغ المسكينين المسكارين يا الله يا أستاذ تجيب يا الله the biggest misgiving and misguiding we have in this time is is wasting of time يا الله يا أستاذ Overlook all the time that we wasted, particularly in this month, Ya Allah. We ask you to give us the resolve and the steadfast intention, Ya Rahman Rahim, not to waste any more time or to waste as little as time as possible, Ya Allah. Firstly, wasting it by doing nothing, Ya Allah. Secondly, by wasting it in fruitless endeavors, Ya Allah. We ask you to make sure those people that are very cautious about their time. Because, Ya Allah, you said in the Quran, Wal Asr, and you said that all human beings are in loss, Ya Allah. We don't want to be those human beings that are in loss. We want to be those human beings that are, that are near to you and close to you in all circumstances and situations. We want to be those human beings that you're pleased with, Ya Arhamar Rahimin. Ya Allah, we want to be those, those human beings that follow the Prophet of Allah and embody his sunnah and emulate him in every facet of their lives so we can understand the reality of what it means to be your, your servant, Ya Arhamar Rahimin, your abad. Ya Allah, we ask you to, to forgive our parents, our forefathers, Ya Arhamar Rahimin, and to look after our brothers and sisters and guide them to the right path, Ya Arhamar Rahimin, and our neighbors and our friends. We ask you to, to make us the cause of guidance for this land and this continent, Ya Rahman Rahim, and in the world over, if we ever have that opportunity and chance, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, we ask you to lift the difficulties, the trials, the tribulations, the injustices, and the oppressions of the Ummah of the Prophet of Allah, Ya Sallam. And we ask you, Ya Allah, to, to give us the reality and the understanding that our own affairs are in our own hands, and that by seeking and beseeching you, Ya Allah, and by changing our own, our own lives, that you will change us and you will change the, the society in which we live in, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, we ask you to empower us in this fashion and give us the understanding, Ya Allah, to work to, to make that change firstly in ourselves and then we leave it to you, Ya Allah, to make the rest of the changes in the rest of humanity. Ya Allah, we ask you in this blessed month, the, the month where the, the, the evil shi'atin are locked up and the mischievous shi'atin are locked up, to give us the capacity to see that our own misgivings and misguidings, Ya Allah, to see our own faults, Ya Arhamar Rahim. We ask you, Ya Allah, to give us the capacity to change those faults, Ya Allah. We ask you, Ya Arhamar Rahim, to give us the, the understanding of our own selves and our own vices, Ya Allah, so we can overcome those vices in this blessed time. Ya Allah, we've only got a few days left of this month, and we renew our intention to worship you properly and, and, and attain taqwa in this month, and also to have thanks and be, grat- and, and be gracious to you, Ya Arhamar Rahim, as you're gracious to us in this month and in all months. Ya Allah, we know the month of the day of, 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 of Qadr, Laylatul Qadr is coming up. Ya Allah, we ask you that, uh, to give us the understanding of when this day is and allow us to, the, this evening is, Ya Allah, and allow us to spend this night in a way that's most blessed to you. Ya Allah, you're the only forgiver of, of sins, Ya Allah. We ask you to forgive our sins, Ya Allah. We ask you to make us of those people, Ya Arhamar Rahimin, that are most beloved to you in this life. And Ya Allah, we ask you to elevate the station of our, of our Mashiach, Ya Allah. We ask you to give them the power. We ask you to give them the support to fight the evil that's in the, that's in the world and the support and the power, Ya Allah, to guide us to overcome our own evil souls and our own lower selves, Ya Allah, in order that we may be illuminated by your grace and your glory and your majesty, Ya Allah. And we ask you to bless this place and bless those who attend, Ya Allah. And we ask you to bless the, the organizers of, uh, uh, and those who allow us to be in this place and make their lives easier and better for the khidmah they've done and the service they've done to you and to your deen, Ya Allah. Bi khayrim lutfin wa afiyah. Wa ila hadrat al-nabi bi sir al-fatiha. It's a housekeeping matter. So we discussed last week and previously that we were going to... Um,